Good morning, Dr. Asina. Good morning, how are you? Fine, thank you. We are waiting. How about you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I don't have classes today, it's good. It's perfect. Yes, my free day. I'll be here the whole day. Good morning, Dr. Madeli. Good morning, Dr. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine. I know it is very late, uh, and I appreciate for you to become. Thank you.
Good morning to everyone. I hope you can hear me. Good, good morning. Good morning, dear Professor Dr. Adil Cham, our dear valuable rector. It's a great honor to see you in this meeting, indeed. And hopefully within five minutes, we will start. But uh, before starting, uh, let me sh share some, share the program to see how the author will be able to use them uh, during the conference. Okay. If you if you look at the program, actually we have three parallel sessions starting from twelve for session A, B, and C. Uh, so the session A and B assigned to English authors. So the sessions uh, we, we will run them in English, and also we will have for this year. Turkish session. So all the authors who would like to join the session, you are most welcome. At the same time, the Turkish translation of uh, uh, the articles uh, is also available. I mean, the English ones. So the, uh, the authors from the other sessions, they are, you are kindly invited to read if you would like to uh, see whether if it's any of them was interesting for you. So you. Apart from that, in each session, there is a button, uh, click to hear button. In any session, which has been assigned a specific time, uh, you, you are most welcome to uh, click just the button and it will automatically uh, guide you to specifically on that session. So it has been assigned exactly like that in each day. So by the time, I will share also with you the, uh, uh, the, the final program, including the YouTube uh, links for each article, so you will be able uh, to have it. And also, I'm glad to inform you that actually, if you finish this program, uh, including all the uh, videos, each speech, and everything, it will be the second, actually, world second conference ebook virtual proceedings. Uh, let's say. The first one is also belong to our university, the, which uh, in our previous year. So the program have been designed in such a way that all the uh, speech will be recorded and will be added to the program. So after we will share with you after the conference, hopefully. And. No, it's okay, not yet. Just a moment. I'm just waiting two more minutes, then we will start. So, dear valuable authors, welcome. Dear Professor Dr. Sadri, Malcolm Simon, Haidar. Just me.
I think uh, it was a good introduction to the uh, history of the conference. Um, let's, uh, we shall start uh, officially. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, depending wherever you are on this uh, planet, our distinguished guests, academic colleagues, and students. On behalf of the Organizing Committee of the Force International Conference of Contemporary Affairs in Architecture and Urbanism at Alanya Hep University, I'm honored and delighted to welcome you all at Alanya Hep University ICCA UA 2021 conference. As you may know, the main reason that we have decided to hold our conference online was due to the recent pandemic. So here, the important question that I would like to raise in this conference is that why our design approaches in public space fail to respond to the properly designed public spaces regarding the pandemic? And what will be our approach in post-pandemic era? Therefore, in order to create much more vital environment, Rethinking the idea of proper planning must be the main priority of the architects and urban planners. As the manifestos for the recent pandemic, I believe that there is the desire and to design a better world together would be considered as our main strategy to bring back the livability uh, to the post-pandemic era. We have launched this annual conference about four years ago during organizing ICCA UA 2021, based on our global advertisements, we have received 250 papers from 45 different countries. And after doing all the review and registration process, 196 high quality manuscripts from 35 different countries have been accepted for publication in the proceedings of the conference. Our technical program for this conference is rich and varied with seven keynote speeches and four invited talks and around 196 technical papers which have been split between three parallel sessions to be discussed during these two days. As the conference chair of the conference, I know that the success of the conference depends ultimately on many people who have worked with us in planning and organizing the conference. In particular, I thank the rector of Alanya Hep University, Professor Dr. Ekrem Oskul, and Dr. Murat Ertan Erdogan, Professor Dr. Errol Sain, and Dr. Evren Lukeriulis, who respectively are General Secretary, Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, and Head of the Department of Architecture at Alanya Hep University. I also thank to all the organizing committee members Specifically, Professor Dr. Jose Manuel Teis Matrical from German University of Cairo, as the president of the conference, Professor Maldam Simone, Dr. Roxane Rafarian Yaz, and Dr. Seda Bostanji, who supports us as conference chairs, and all the reviewers of the Journal of Contemporary Affairs for their detailed and timely reviewing of the papers. My acknowledge also goes to Dr. Igor. Kalsta from Cardiff University, Professor Dr. Ihab El Ziadi from the University of Oregon, and Professor Dr. Ni Kam from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and Professor Dr. Hussein Seti from the University of uh, Conway and Girna American University, and Professor Dr. Islam El Gonaimi from the University of Bahrain, and Professor Dr. Haider Ali from Ulma University and Dr. Milika Maksic from Institute of Urban Planning, City of Nish from Serbia, and Dr. Hussam Hussein from German University of Cairo. 
for the delivery of their insightful keynotes that I'm sure these talks will involve profound intellectual discoveries. I hope you enjoy the excellent academic and cultural atmosphere of the conference and wish you all productive conference ahead. Only my own personal notes that I would like to say that it has been a real privilege to be the chairman of this conference. And thanks for all of your amazing works and participations that I really appreciate. That is all from me, and I'm delighted I will be replaced with um, Professor Malcolm Simon from University of Maryland. After concluding our opening speech, our keynote speaker and, uh, will try uh, to have welcome the authors. So, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the conference, and I'm looking forward to work with you and these days. Thank you very much indeed. I think actually it was a uh, uh, introduction to the history of the conference. And so let's ask uh, from Professor Maldem. Let's clap our hands for Professor Maldem Simona to have its own, her own welcoming speech. Oh, well, thank you. Good morning. And welcome to the fourth International Conference of Contemporary Affairs in Architecture and Urbanism. It's uh, a very early morning here in Washington, DC. And uh, many times uh, for all of you around the world. Uh, although I wish I could be with you in person at Alanya Hep University in the beautiful host city I'm delighted that it is so easy for us to come together as colleagues in uh, this virtual space from a multitude of countries around the world. Thank you for joining the conference. I hope you come away with new colleagues and new ideas. The conference program is packed with fascinating topics. I look forward to hearing your talks. In my keynote talk a bit later this morning, I will introduce you to a transnational collaboration of students and faculty from the United States and Iraq that adopts the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals as our shared agenda to design a better world together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Maldem Simon for your welcoming speech. Um, now let's uh, clap our hand for Dr. Evren Ulkeriolus, who is the head of the Department of Architecture at Alanya Hep University. Dr. Evren Ulkeriolus, if you if you are around, so we are. Here. Yes, John. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, dear Evren John. Welcome to the fourth of this conference. Dear researchers, authors, keynote speakers, organizing co committee members, and all our guests who are now online. As the head of the Department of Architecture, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth International Conference of Contemporary Affairs in Architecture and Urbanism. Unfortunately, as you know, due to the coronavirus pandemic, we couldn't manage to hold our conference as its regular way to meet you with face to face. Nevertheless, we decided to hold our conference online. Organizing committee of the conference strived hard to adopt their strategy in order to keep quality of the event as it has been held in the last three years. In this regard, I would like to thank to all organizing committee members for providing such a great context to exchange ideas. And I would like also thank to our valuable keynote speakers for accepting our invitation to be part of a provider in the field of contemporary architecture and urbanism. Finally, I would like to close my speech by wishing the conference very success. And I hope that every one of you will have meaningful exchange from this conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Dr. Pramujan, uh, for your speech. Uh, and now, uh, our Dean of the Faculty of 
architecture at Alanya Hebrew University is here with us. It was a great pleasure to, to uh, have Professor Dr. Errol Sion. So, and now I'm going to uh, give the platform to him to have his, his own introduction. Uh, so let's clap our hands to Dr. Errol Sion. Uh, thank you very much, Raish. So since I missed the previous year's face-to-face -face conferences and workshops, I preferred to be not in my office and be next to Raish in the studio, in the kitchen of this conference, which is a very big pleasure for me after two years of online teaching and conferencing and, and, and. But uh, as we all know, this is the new paradigm of the 21st century. Uh, 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 currently, I am reading the new version of a uh, famous uh, Harare's book, Sapiens, the graphic novel recently published. And he starts this uh, paradigm history with uh, the cognitive revolution 70,000 years ago uh, with uh, the Homo sapiens, uh, who has uh, uh, overrided the Neanderthal uh, ancestors of us. So then uh, again, as you all well know, especially the urban uh, planning and urban history experts, uh, we have the agricultural revolution in Mesopotamia some 34,000 years ago. And then we have the industrial revolution in 1848 using the steam power and uh, giving our manpower, muscle power uh, over to the machines. And now uh, we have in the artificial intelligence uh, revolution and we are this time not giving our muscle power to machines but we are uh, delegating our brain power to machines this time and it is not a science fiction anymore uh, since in our daily life if I place my iPhone, iPad and MacBook Pro next to each other overnight they exchange all the information among themselves without asking me. Of course at the very beginning they ask once uh, to allow them to do this exchange automatically between themselves and then uh, if you open your iPad or iPhone you see that the addresses are updated and the apps are transferred among themselves and so on. Of course there are some uh, threatening uh, aspects as in any technology, including the very ancient technology of fire making. Uh, but uh, as humanity, we have uh, to take our, uh, develop our norms, rules, ethical uh, approaches on this new artificial intelligence technology. Uh, it is not far away from us. Uh, as I said, it is in our daily uh, life. Uh, we are talking from Google's or Apple's uh, driverless cars, self-driven cars, but we have on the field already in, in a wide range self-driven tractors who are connected to navigation satellites and meteorology satellites, and they do everything on the field without the farmer themselves, without the driver, of course. So uh, in the uh, COVID, as Grace correctly uh, emphasized, since two years, this conference is uh, being made online. Uh, but it will affect, as, as I uh, emphasized in my opening uh, keynote speech last year, uh, we have to consider that in our further designs in architecture and urban affairs, uh, which is a responsibility of this community to adapt ourselves as the World Health Organization warns, this is not the last epidemic in the world, we are going to have more viral epidemies, which are not to be called as uh, COVID or they will have some other name, but our uh, physical spaces are, as again, Quraysh emphasized and underlined, have to be designed uh, after this uh, threat uh, for the sake of our humanity which is a big responsibility for architects and urban planners, but with the accumulation of knowledge over centuries, I think these professions will, uh, they are able to carry this burden and find out uh, synthesizers and useful solutions uh, for humanity. So I am thanking the organizing committee, especially Grace and Roxana, who have spent a lot of effort, our supporting assistants and all the international community who have participated, the all speakers, which is a tremendous effort uh, in the academic field, 
uh, and I say, uh, uh, hoping to see you in the fifth of these conferences next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Professor Dr. Errol Chan from the uh, head of the Department of Architecture at Alanya University. And now uh, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, one of the main, main the only main pillar of uh, the conference, the one who have been, let's say, um, that support us since uh, five years ago to establish the conference and to run the conference. And he has been with us during the last four, uh, four and five years. And uh, we also, you know, that this year we are going to, uh, we are also German University of uh, Cairo also uh, uh, supporting us in this conference. So, uh, Dean of the Faculty of uh, Architecture at, uh, from German University of uh, Cairo is right now is here. So ladies and gentlemen, let's clap our hands to Professor Dr. Uh, Jose Manuel Page Madrigal. Hello, good morning, Sabahar here. Egunon, Gunaidin, Buenos Dias, I don't know, or maybe in Italian, Buongiorno Anki. Um, um, for me, it's a real pleasure to be here today uh, and a sign of happiness after seeing how this process has been growing up in the last uh, year. And uh, I, must, I must tell all of you that in my opinion, uh, the, uh, I, would write, I would like to, to remark the maturity of, of this event, uh, not only because of the number of, of papers, but even because of the quality of them. We will have opportunity to, to talk about that only at the end, maybe later. You know? uh, these words are only um, um, a welcome note. And at the same time, I would like to remark that uh, I am really proud, not only as uh, director of, of uh, architecture and, uh, urban and urban design in, in here in Cairo, in German University, but even as coordinator of uh, Agora Network, where I can see some of the faces here, which is maybe uh, the most important um, um, reason to, to be here all together. Agora, as you know, uh, uh, was born exactly uh, around six months ago, and the main objective was to join the forces of the different schools of architecture and urban design in all the Euromed region. And I am really happy to see even the answers of the different uh, partners we have. So again, my, my thanks, special thanks to uh, our colleagues, Roxane and Anahuash, but not only them. I know that these things are not, not possible to be done with only a personal or individual effort but probably because of the capacity of this couple to, to join together different spirits and especially different ways of understanding what is learning and teaching architecture today. But it's maybe one of the main reasons why we are here. As you know, hopefully uh, I will uh, uh, tell you as only uh, one note about the, the different papers we are presented. There are there are important contributions for the COVID areas. And at this, at this moment, I must tell you that really, this is the reason why I must apologize because of the not attendant the absence of our dear president of the uh, German University in Cairo, just because of that. So I am so sorry, but even on behalf of, of him and the university, all our support, not only for today, but for coming editions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, Dr. Hurash, it's on mute. Yes, yes, I think it's important. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, dear Professor Dr. Matrigal, for your speech. I really appreciate that. I think uh, Professor Dr. Yasser El Hajazi, the president of the German University of Cairo, has recently uh, has a pro health issue. He has got uh, coronavirus uh, three days ago, exactly. 
uh, but unfortunately uh, we missed her and uh, him and now uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, let's uh, clap our hand to our rector of the university of alanya happy university uh, so i'm going to uh, ask from our professor to uh, have our speech welcoming speech thank you very much ladies and gentlemen as rector of Alanya Hep University, I would like to welcome you all uh, to the fourth International Conference of Contemporary Affairs in Architecture and Urbanism. As my colleagues mentioned, due to the uh, ongoing uh, pandemic, the conference will be held online like the previous one. Therefore, I would like to introduce you our university briefly uh, to our participants. We are a small scale university, maybe you can call a boutique university in the Mediterranean town of uh, Alanya. The area we are located is known as the Turkish Riviera and uh, with many facilities and possibilities for cultural events uh, in addition to tourism and uh, education. And I hope uh, and wish uh, we can host you in person as Professor uh, Madeleine Simon mentioned, uh, we can host you here in person uh, in Alanya next time uh, to offer uh, uh, exciting uh, social program. Uh, at the moment, uh, Alanya Hamdulayn Pasha University has four faculties, uh, namely uh, Architecture Faculty, Arts and Design Faculty, Engineering, and uh, Economics and uh, Business and uh, 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 economics and administrative sciences faculties. And also we have a graduate school B2 program, gastronomy and culinary arts and architecture. And also we have a school of uh, foreign languages that teaches basic English and modern language courses. We also uh, have a newly established two-year vocational college. Uh, we are a young university too, and uh, this is the third year that we are having graduation from uh, bachelor degree programs. Here in our university, besides our efforts to provide a high quality education and research, one of the miss miss uh, missions of the university is to add uh, scientific and academic value to the society in terms of university uh, society sector uh, cooperation. This conference is uh, one of the products of this mission and today we can see uh, our efforts are yielding uh, results. As uh, Dr. Horesh mentioned, this fourth conference reached a, a considerable number of uh, participation and submissions. It's a definite sign that it is becoming more mature as uh, Professor Madrigal mentioned uh, and more sustainable. I would like to thank the organizing committee of the conference for their hard work uh, to make the conference sustainable and survive under these difficult conditions. And also uh, my colleagues, the members of the architecture, uh, fac architecture faculty, uh, Dean uh, Errol Sayin and uh, the uh, chairman, uh, chair lady, <laughs> Uh, of the uh, department uh, I also would uh, want to express my gratitude to all distinguished authors, keynote speakers, participants, uh, organizing committee and students. Uh, the conference uh, becomes meaningful with your contributions. I am sure at the end of the conference, the participants will gain a valuable insight from presentations and talks and deliberations about the subjects. With this opportunity, I would like to uh, thank also uh, to the uh, healthcare uh, uh, personnel, nurses, doctors, health workers in Turkey and all around the world uh, who are fighting in front of the uh, line against the Corona-19 pandemics. And I wish a urgent uh, health uh, to our colleagues, uh, the president of uh, the uh, German University in Cairo. I hope uh, he gets well uh, uh, soon and uh, uh, we can meet him uh, face to face uh, uh, in next uh, uh, months. 
Finally, uh, uh, I am I'm uh, extending my uh, gratitude to the organizing committee, uh, starting from the uh, ch uh, chair of the conference, uh, my colleague, Kuresh, uh, and uh, all the, uh, the, the vice uh, chair, uh, Professor Majigal, and all the organizing committee members. I wish uh, you the best luck and health. Enjoy the online days ahead and have a productive event. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, dear Professor Dr. Errol Oskul. It was a great pleasure to have you here, indeed. And specifically for this year, uh, we, ha we have invited a very distinguished keynote speaker, world's highly cited, uh, uh, let's say, keynote speakers are here with us. They are very famous uh, uh, in their profession, specifically in the design profession, starting from uh, uh, Malden, Professor Malden Simon, Simon uh, which has uh, got AIA Architectural Award, and also for uh, the keynote speaker that we will go with, to have, for example, Dr. Ihab El Ziyad, uh, uh, and also Igor Plaza, or Professor Dr. Hossein Sadri, and uh, the Dr. Usam Hussein. The one that you will see in the list, it has been selected. Uh, uh, carefully based on their let's say academic uh, uh, let's say profession and uh, so it has been uh, for this year specifically it has been uh, selected carefully the keynote speakers so uh, we shall start with the uh, professor dr ihab el ziadi if uh, he is around and if not we shall yes. do Yes, dear professor. Welcome. So sorry, I have just seen Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, it's a pleasure to join you. Um, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm uh, really honored to join you uh, from Oregon, uh, the US, uh, the US, uh, the Pacific North Coast. And um, um, it's actually midnight, close to midnight here. So I'm getting ready to go to sleep. Uh, so it's a, it's a great thing to uh, talk to you before going to sleep. I'll have good dreams uh, afterwards. <laughs> um, um, I wanted to um, really express my gratitude at this, and I wanted to kind of pose um, two main um, uh, questions, um, provocations, so to speaking, uh, for us to think um, outside the box. Um, uh, the global pandemic that we are living in now make us all connected um, in, a, in a very different way. Um, a very minor incident or minor um, action somewhere in the world can touch all of us. Um, so uh, let's think about how this can impact our design and think outside our boxes, think outside architecture, think about the impact of architecture on the global scale and the life cycle analysis of buildings, the life cycle energy use of buildings, and all these issues that really are uh, let us to think really outside. Um, and I, um, the other issue that I wanted to provocate with is thinking inside the box, uh, the fact that we're all kind of inside our boxes now, um, uh, joining this conference. 90% of our time are spending indoors. Um, how can we uh, create indoor spaces that impact occupants' health, well-being, and mental health, um, and more or less? in these kind of uh, really weird times that we are in. So uh, in my keynote, I will stress about uh, how we use large uh, pools of data um, information, both inside and outside. Our spaces are really full of information. And if we can kind of purpose them to a really greater use, uh, we can help design better buildings and better spaces uh, for the health and well-being of the occupants. I look forward to sharing my uh, keynote with you later, and uh, thank you again for um, inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Professor Dr. Ihab El Ziyati. I really appreciate that. Uh, but in the keynote uh, spe uh, speech session, we will try to have fully, uh, let's say, uh, to read the full bibliography of each keynote speaker to be uh, uh, familiar uh, completely with the keynotes. So, since it was just opening speech, that's why. Uh, my apologies that I couldn't manage to completely introduce you, but uh, at this keynote speech, uh, we will uh, try to uh, 
mention uh, completely the self biography of each author. And now, uh, let's, dear valuable uh, author, let's uh, um, clap our hand to Professor Dr. Uh, Igor Platzava from the Cardiff University of the UK. Uh, dear Professor Dr. Igor, thank you and congratulations for your recent book of Smart City Citizenship. And the platform is yours. Let's. Herkese, Gunaidin. Good morning, everyone. First and foremost, sorry, because my pronunciation, of course, is not native. Um, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the, the organizers for inviting me, giving uh, this keynote at this, let's say, quite crucial time, personally, academically, publishing a book. But also, as uh, previous keynote you know, speakers mentioned, I think that we all are under the influence of this post-pandemic time. So um, uh, at the moment, I'm in Wales, in Cardiff, um, working as a senior research fellow, uh, mainly trying to intersect the digital, urban, and political transformations from the social innovation perspective. So in my keynote, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present the recent book uh, called Smart City Citizenship, recently published by, uh, by Elsevier. Um, I think that just a, a couple of a couple of uh, ideas uh, before joining Cardiff. I've been over the last ten years at the University of Oxford in the Future of Cities program and Urban Transformations, funded by the ESRC and Horizon 2020 by the European Commission. But alongside this, um, as an academic, I've been uh, working uh, uh, in the policy field um, in the Joint Research Center in Italy. Uh, probably blending a smart city from the AI and digital transformation perspective. Um, and also I'm a um, senior advisor from the UN Habitat um, program called People Center Smart City. So as you are going to see what I'm going to try, probably is unpacking what a smart city really mean. I think that we need to reshuffle the meaning of a smart city that has been so far a very technocratic uh, let's say term and also application as we have seen in many projects uh, under the umbrella of Horizon 2020 smart cities and communities. So what I'm trying to advocate, I think that I'm interested in how digital transformation processes driven by AI disruption in the post GDPR current con context are altering the, the technopolitical and democratic conditions of data governance for the emergence of uh, new citizenship uh, regimes worldwide. So uh, I'm welcome to, um, to this uh, conference and I'm looking forward to um, delivering my, my keynote later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear uh, Dr. Igor Kalzawa. Uh, uh, and congratulations one more time for your recent book of Smart City Citizenship. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's clap our hands to Professor Dr. Hossein Satri, who is the uh, previous ex vice rector of Latin American University. And are right now is uh, working at the as academic staff in the Canterbury University of the uh, UK. So, dear Professor Dr. Hossein Sadri, welcome to the conference. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to, to, to have the chance to talk to you, to listen to you and to contribute to this very valuable uh, conference in its fourth edition. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, mainly working in the future of the cities as well and uh, with the concern about the future of our planet and future of humanity. Uh, so I'm coming from more political uh, dimensions of urban and architecture uh, studies. And uh, uh, I was looking at the topics of the conference and I, I just realized that such a diversity uh, we are hosting this year. Uh, I would like to thank all of the organization committee members and the chairs and the hosting universities. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, looking forward to listen to all of you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Professor uh, Dr. Hussain Sadri for your speech. And now let's uh, clap our hand to uh, Dr. Hussam Hussain, who is the president of Agora Community, which is mostly focused on the Mediterranean cities. Um, uh, if uh, Dr. Hussam is around, so uh, we are. Hello. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Orash, and good morning to all of, uh, of you presenting today here at the International Conference of Contemporary Affairs in Architecture and Urbanism in, the, in its fourth edition, and this time with special effort, uh, joint effort with the uh, German University in Cairo. Uh, I'm Hossam Hossein, speaking to you today exactly from the German University in Cairo. And I will be with you during the whole event, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome all of you today here. Um, I would like to thank very much Dr. Horaj and Dr. Uh, uh, Rofsana for their kind invitation at this wonderful event. Uh, I have been following the previous conferences over the four um, years and, and all of their activities. And it's amazing to see how it's constantly developing and rap rapidly improving actually. And it is well, it very, very well deserved. And congratulations on this uh, wonderful platform that uh, put us all together every year. Every year, actually, um, it's like uh, like it's like every year. Actually, all the aspects of, of the conference keep changing, but the main theme about architecture and urbanism uh, is is covering our everyday aspects. And especially this year, it's covering all society, all aspects of society through this very condensed two uh, days conference. Um, it is a very unique theme, uh, I think. And, and I think uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Horash and Dr. Uh, Sana is putting into this conference, it's, it's a great, great effort that um, I am I'm really speechless and I, I don't know how energetic these people are. So uh, congratulations on this uh, uh, successful uh, events always. And my speech will be tomorrow, and I will reflect on certain way of thinking about urban and rural communities, um, probably from uh, a territorial Mediterranean perspective into more of a regional planning perspective, uh, specifically in, in Egypt and, and, and northern coast of Egypt and Cairo. Uh, and at the end, of course, these kind of uh, conferences, it's a, it's a way for us to, uh, uh, a chance for us to, to, to connect uh, and look for future collaborations. So please, let's do this because I think this is the main aim at the end of the conferences and uh, looking forward to this great event and all the best for all the panelists. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, dear uh, Dr. Hussam. Sometimes we are forgetting uh, the person who are very close to us. Uh, Dr. Hussam actually, since the previous year, exactly he's close working with us to organize this conference. And even I think I forgot uh, to uh, mention your name at into my introduction speech. I'm really sorry for that, but uh, thank you uh, for your all your support during these years, actually, let's say. And uh, we have uh, three uh, keynote speakers, uh, which uh, I'm going to play their um, welcoming speech since uh, they couldn't uh, manage to be uh, uh, to participate because it was very late on on their uh, home country. Hello, my name is Mi Kao I am a professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm the vice chairman of the Department of Geography and Resource Management and Director of the Urban Studies Program. I'm also an Associate Director of the Institute of Future Cities, where I run um, the Center for Community and Place Governance. So I would like to welcome you to the fourth International Conference of Contemporary Affairs in Architecture and Urbanism. So while I look forward to learning from you all, I will also share in my keynote speech a topic related to urbanism. I will talk about people's rights to the development of space and place in our cities. Why is this important? It is because this will directly affect our physical, emotional, psychological, and social well-being. So I hope you will enjoy the conference, and may I wish the conference every success. It's my pleasure to express my deepest
Dr. Haidar is uh, here. Yes. Why the sound is not clear? Why not? Professor Dr. Haider, sorry, I haven't recognized you around, so um, you may have your speech. So, Professor Dr. Haider, if you look at this citation, actually, one of the most highly cited uh, also scholar in the field of architecture and technology. Uh, please, uh, Professor Dr. Haider, if you would like to have your own welcome speech, you are most welcome, or if you wish, I can play the uh, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nia, and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Rokshana, for inviting me and giving an opportunity to be to, to be a part of this prestigious forum, this global uh, international forum. Actually, welcome to all participants attending from different parts of the globe. Hope you all are well and safe during this pandemic and critical time. Since we are almost restricted to stay in our house, so that's the this is the way we are meeting virtually. So it is my pleasure to express my deepest gratitude to all the uh, participants, especially the chair of this conference, uh, for inviting me and sharing my research uh, to the global uh, uh, speakers and the audience. I am Professor Hyder Ali Vishash from Khulna University, Bangladesh. Basically, I am a mathematician. I, I work on mathematical modeling and apply to different biological and environmental and climate model. So my research area actually include dynamic optimization technique applied to such type of models, how mathematics can play roles to the changing phenomena of non-linear behavior of this uh, climate sense attitude and the phenomena. So actually this is a very interesting forum to share and to work together on this global issue, especially for the global warming and the climate change what we are facing in the near future, especially for the next century. So this is the time we should work together. I think this international forum will open a such type of opportunity to work on these global issues together and making a international networking to come forward for the sustainable development for our future life for our future being. So thank everybody and thank the organizer for inviting me and become a part of this international session. Thank you and thank you everybody. Thank you very much to uh, Professor Dr. Haidar. I think Dr. Uh, Milika is also, I, I have seen that she sent a she sent the note uh, if she's around. Yes. Here, Dr. Mirika, welcome. Welcome Thank from the uh, city of Nish in Serbia. So you may ha have your own introduction speech if you want. So then. Thank you. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Welcome to the conference. Uh, ahead of us, there are two interesting days of exchanging experiences. Uh, this year, we had uh, a lot of inspiring topics from all over the world. I encourage you to actively participate in discussions and to make this conference even more interesting. I hope you'll enjoy the conference days and I wish the conference every success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Liska, I really appreciate your uh, availability and accepting our invitation. And uh, and last but not least, uh, our dear valuable professor, Dr. Islam El Bonaimi, uh, who is also uh, supports us since 2018. 
uh, I'm going to welcome him if he's around to have his own opening speech. And if he's not around, uh, we I will introduce him. So he's a, uh, he's a full professor at the uh, University of Bahrain at the same time working in the uh, University of Cairo in the Department of Architecture. He is also one of the full uh, uh, highly cited scholars in his own field of architecture and uh, technology. Of course, uh, we will try, uh, I will try to reach him to be able to introduce uh, uh, himself during the conference. And now uh, we shall, uh, let's say, uh, I'm going to close the welcome speech part and to go to, uh, to the keynote speech parts, which two, day, two days, uh, four of our valuable keynotes are going to uh, have their own speech. So I'm going to, uh, let's say, play their, own, their biography before, let's say, inviting them to have their own live uh, uh, keynote speech. So let me... Professor Dr. Jose Manuel Tej Madiba received his PhD in site planning with the highest class. Uh, dear uh, Dr. Huresh, it is unmuted, probably. He focused on the whole city and complete territory. He has developed the chief of planning with the highest classification in 1995. He is a professor of architecture and urban planning with a long pedagogical trajectory in different Mediterranean universities. His main topic are related to the cities of the East region, especially focused on the whole cities and conflict territories. He has developed DG functions in the University of Portugal, Lebanon, Cyprus, and Egypt. Professor Dr. Madrigo was appointed as a foreign member of the National Academy of Fine Arts in Portugal. <laughs> Professor Dr. Ihab al Ziadi received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee in 2001 and a professional certificate in project and facility management from American University in Cairo in 1990. He is a professor of architecture and the director of the High Performance Environment Laboratory and House of Innovative Technology, testing facility at the Department of Architecture, University of Oregon. His research focuses on indoor environmental quality and accident multi control in green and high performance buildings. <laughs> Dr. Igor Krasada holds a PhD in social innovation with the qualification cum laude from the University of Nevada, Reno, and Mondragon University. He is an academic entrepreneur working in the field of innovative economic and geographic processes in cities and regions with focus on cases and issues of regional and metropolitan devolution and government. In the public sector, he has held the position of director of research and innovation for the Basque Regional Dr. Hurash, it is unmuted once more. His research interests scientific director of the City Regional Congress in 2012. His research interests are in the field of digital 
urban and political transformations. Professor Dr. Jose Sadi is a critic, urban scholar, architect, permaculture designer, activities and writer. In addition to his faculty position at Coventry University in UK, he holds a full professor position at Kirna American University, where he worked as the head of architecture and the dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Design and Fine Arts between 2011 to 2016. He held academic teaching and research positions at the Islamic Azad University of Tabriz in Iran, National Academy of Sciences in Azerbaijan, the American University in Canterbury in UK, and the City University of New York in USA. Professor Martin Semo is a professor and associate for academic affairs and outreach in the School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at the University of Maryland. She is an experienced architect, educator, and scholar educated to preparing students for professional careers in architecture. Her scholarship, research, and creative practice are in the area of design, design thinking, design education design of building and the application of design to issues such as sustainability and community health. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for everyone. Actually, dear value keynotes, uh, I tried to uh, prepare this, uh, we tried to prepare this introduction for today's keynote speech and their telebiography. And uh, this uh, hot, very new, actually, 6 a.m. Uh, we, we managed to prepare this video. Uh, sorry, if I know that it is short. We should have maybe per each uh, keynote two page to, uh, to, to be able to properly uh, like introduce uh, you. But unfortunately, due to the matter of time, we, have, we try to shorten it to one paragraph. And now, uh, actually, I'm going to give the platform uh, to the coordinator of uh, uh, the keynote speaker, speaker session uh, for two days. And I will try to introduce the, uh, the keynote speakers tomorrow early in the morning. So, uh, dear Professor Dr. Uh, Manuel Matrical, our president of the conference, uh, and, and also since the topic is going to be to be discuss in details so that's why we need we will need your support as the coordinator uh, then i will give the platform to the uh, professor dr ihab al ziadi uh, if professor dr ihab is around uh, dr uh, madrigal is around if not i'm going to yes dr Jose Madrigal. Yes, I am. Uh, let yes. us let us go. If you don't mind, dear uh, uh, Professor Huraj, uh, let's go more effective because we are a bit late according to, to the timetable, yes. and I know we must keep that. So it's only to welcome the 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 first of the keynote speakers, which are really the stars today. So I am only uh, my mission would be maybe to to tell them thank you very much, all of them. If you are uh, introducing from there, from Alania, would be great. Uh, and and that's go directly to, to the points. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Professor Dr. Madrigal, letting us uh, to run. Of course, in the sessions, uh, um, you will be moderate the sessions, of course. So uh, thank you. Uh, let's start, Professor Dr. Ihab El Ziati. Uh, he's going to uh, uh, talk uh, this speech with the title of Space as Information, Data Disruption in Architectural Research and Practice. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's clap our hands to Professor Dr. El Ziadi. Thank you very much, Dr. Faraksha. Can you allow share screen, please? Yes, of course. If
I think you are now able to okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. All right. Uh, so let's go. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here with you today um, in a virtual way. Uh, virtual speaking. I want to thank the conference organizers and the chair for the invitation to come and speak to you today. The title of my presentation is Space um, as Information, Data Disruptions in our Special Research and Practice. I'm going to pose a number of questions or provocations for us to think about as we imagine the role of architectural design in both research and practice in the time that we are living in today. Architecture has been always seen as an object. We are fa fascinated by the visuals of that object. Architecture has also been um, a context and a place Architecture has been also about the space we inhabit. I want to think of... Seems, um, well, my video is jumping, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's go back. Architecture has also been um, a context and a place. Architecture has been also about the space we inhabit. I want to think about architecture today as a performance. From that perspective, what if architecture becomes more data-driven performance? What if architecture becomes about information in the space or the space, um, uh, the data that in the space that are guided by information? And what if architecture becomes biophilic, is that it represents the relationship between the rights of nature, the rights of our environment, and our love um, to be in tune with that nature or the biophilia hypothesis. Unfortunately, the rights of nature we haven't been preserving very well. Climate change is not a scene any longer from Blade Runner 2049. It's actually seen from 40 miles away from my house here in Oregon, in the US. Um, this picture was taken in September 2020. Climate change is really here. Um, these are wildfires that burned more than a million acres of land in the northwest of the US, in Oregon, Seattle, um, or Washington, and California. We have knowledge power, we have computing power, we have data and technology to predict it. Uh, to simulate it, to quantify it, and we also have environmental performance and technologies to help beat it and help to kind of really get us out of that climate change scenario. We can, we can forecast the impact of our buildings on global warming, life cycle energy analysis, and so forth. But we don't ask, ask ourselves enough of these serious questions to change the way we design our buildings. We can green and produce much more smarter buildings. We can ask people to embrace much more sustainable lifestyle and behavior, but these acts tend to be separate. We really need to think of design and of space as an experience. Um, we need to think how to act in an integrated performance that links people and better buildings together. We need to design this experience of the in-between, the space in the middle, no longer designing the, just the object and no longer just influencing the people. We need to kind of think about people building and the global environment. And we need to think about the space as information, as data, as a data-driven, human-centric uh, approach to design. There are a number of competing theories of um, basically human-centric um, design. What I kind of want to um, really refer to more in my presentation is, is the biophilic dimension of this place experience and the need um, to think about buildings with this through this lens of biophilia or biophilic design in a, in a more human-centric uh, design approach. Um, there are a number of kind of underlying conceptual framework 
that we have here is the uh, was the basis of a series of questions that we've been asking for over a decade uh, related to how buildings and how the built environment really affect our behavior, affect our comfort, affect our, our well-being, and affect our um, basically the, uh, the buildings we live in and the global environment in the same way. We've been asking about the relationship between these biophilic elements of the environment and our spent wellness. It's a growing interest that we have been uh, really engaged in for more than a decade. Um, one of these um, basically uh, studies that we've done looked at the relationship between buildings and their context, the relationship between views and how um, architectural frames views and how views and nature anchors buildings. And we looked at how people reacted to these views from their workspaces. So we collected a number of views, more than 50 views from different work environments. And we asked over 300 people to start to quantify them and rank them or sort them according to preference. And what we find that um, these 12 views, which is representative of many of the views we uh, collected, um, tend to provide examples of degrees of nature and urban setting in a continuum. The top four views were mostly preferred and highly ranked. The four views on the bottom were least preferred, and the middle ones were somehow in between as an average. When we rasterized and performed content analysis on these views and pixel rasterization, we find um, patterns, um, and these patterns were more related to fractal patterns found in nature. Interestingly, the top four views took us surface complexities that match our innate fractal fluency, fluencies or appreciation for fractal patterns that we are innate in our system, that we grew up and, and we got accustomed, you know, kind of almost um, um, for generations to appreciate. Um, these fractal complexities were at the range of 10 dimension of 1.5 to dimension of 1.7. The bottom um, is the fractal dimension of around 1.1 to 1.3, and the ones in between were at the fractal uh, dimension of 1.5. Um, what would that mean, these fractal dimensions are also correlated to the content of these views. Uh, when we go down and analyze the composition of these views and the frequency of their composition, we found the presence of sky, trees, shrubs, soft ground, plants are most important. Hardscape, buildings, landscape objects, pedestrian windows, and voids in buildings are of middle importance, and paved areas, streets, parking lots, etc., were the least um, uh, preferred uh, or portion of the views. It was also important to think the relationship between view sheds and the reciprocity between architecture and these views. What we were able to also do uh, once we analyze this large pool of data, uh, we find an uh, interesting correlation between um, the preference of these views and the fractal um, elements of these views um, to occupant sick leave. Um, uh, people who were um, um, occupying offices um, over 24 months uh, and subjected to these better views took 50% less sick leave and were reported to have less and less of these sick building syndrome symptoms that you see here on your screen, asthma, headaches, toughness, muscle pain, fatigue, etc. We asked another question um, as to what is the relationship between these biophilic patterns and occupant preferences. And we did a number of experiments subjecting occupants in offices um, and participants in offices and work environments to screens um, of different daylighting and glare and fractal compositions. Um, and in general, we found a very strong correlation between these fractal patterns that lie in this 1.5 dimension, the fractal D 1.5 to 1.7, were more correlated to visual interest over these rectangular or striped pattern. We also found when you project this um, three-dimensionally in space um, of these five patterns and fractal patterns, um, there was a very strong correlation to those between 1.3 and 1.7 with visual interest and the avoidance of feelings of boredom um, and uh, more related to feelings of excitation. These were also reported to have um, less impacts on depression, so people who were in the more visual interest and excitation reported less feelings of seasonal affective disorders and depression. 
Another question we asked about um, biophilic design was the dynamism, the idea of a dynamic environment, um, and the relationship between how dynamic environment and changes in the environment, not just its pattern or elements, can impact people's comfort. We test a number of changes through dynamic streams, mo mobile streams that are actually changing the environment. We also tested uh, somehow variability in the environment related to this anesthesia hypothesis, which has to do with the um, tending to set, set the environment in slightly less comfortable conditions and then return it back to comf comfort conditions. It's the same idea when you open a window and get a fresh breeze of air um, over a hot, for example, afternoon in the summer. And, and we uh, started projecting um, these dappled effects of light and, and heat and sun uh, in spaces and kind of allowing them to move and change throughout the day. And what we find that not only these changes were, were able to reduce energy consumption and reduce unneeded heat losses and gains, but also improve people's sensation of comfort and visual and thermal pleasures um, because it allowed for this environmental uh, variability. And then driving these um, variabilities to certain extremes within the comfort range, so at the, at the cusp of cool or at the cusp of heat within the kind of boundary of comfort, extending the extreme set of comfort conditions, um, these variabilities were more important than the static state of comfort and were really correlated with better um, uh, thermal pleasure, better kind of indoor comfort for these occupants. We started also looking at this ecosystem of biophilic elements. So not just elements, not just attributes, and not just patterns, but what if all of them start to kind of coexist together? Um, this kind of biophilic elements, biophilic attributes, um, biophilic um, dynamism or changes in the environment. Um, we, had the, um, we had the opportunity to test this um, theory for 36 months, three years. Um, over a project where um, people, uh, 800 employees were moving from a traditional building on the right to a more green biophilic um, building on the left. Uh, and we were able to integrate a lot of these biophilic elements, like um, views of nature, or views um, um, of uh, elements of nature, um, uh, changes in the envelope um, that has to do with the with variability and, and so forth. And we tested this by surveying the occupants before and after over a period of three years. Um, and what we found interestingly that um, health complaints and health symptoms decreased by 26.8% and positive responses about productivity and health in the new building increased by 26.9%, leading to an overall improvement of almost 54% in perceived productivity and health in the newer um, biophilic building over the uh, traditional building. We also found that there was a reduction of sick building syndrome symptoms of 28.6% and an increase in multi-comfort levels um, from visual, thermal, indoor air and acoustics uh, between 5 to 91%. To summarize, um, I'd like to um, uh, just provoca provocate people to think about what is the elements of biophilia, what are the patterns of biophilia, and how can we design a human-centric um, environment, and what is kind of parameters of a human-centric approach to biophilic design, and how can we adapt this as a way to think about it and kind of be enriched by data-driven um, and um, information-driven uh, scenario based on research rather than just based on gut feeling. And I don't want to take away the gut feeling because um, you have to be excited about with what, we're, what you're doing. Uh, and as architects, we always have a tinkering approach to design, uh, practicing, modeling, um, engaging, not just about digitization and data, but also the sense of exploration and the sense of experimentation and the power of architecture in that kind of providing the tinkering and experimentation uh, before we kind of vent venture into digital driven modeling and simulation. I also want to embrace the power of architecture to play, um, to drive innovation rather than just a technological silver bullet. And I also think uh, and believe in the power of architecture to help us imagine and dream and think about hope 
uh, of a climate resilience, of a hope over the future for our children. As we as we kind of said, great buildings must begin with the unmeasurable. Go through measurable means to be unmeasurable again. I invite you to think with me about a space that's driven architecture uh, in research and, and practice, and the space not only just as beauty and aesthetic, but also as information. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions at the Q&A session. Thank you very much, dear Professor Dr. Rehab. Indeed, it was a, we can call it cutting edge methodology and technology that you have used uh, to talk about interconnect the interrelation between uh, biophilic architecture and human comfort zone and uh, uh, the beauty of the environment. So uh, maybe uh, we shall, uh, if we shall, we will discuss in round table with Professor Dr. Um, uh, Madrigal, uh, if in, if there uh, was any question from the authors, they may take a note. And uh, after finishing our keynote speech, uh, we will try to have our roundtable and uh, with the coordination of Professor Dr. Madrigal. Uh, Thank you. Shall uh, shall we go, Professor Madrigal, to our second unmute? Professor Madrigal, uh, unfortunately, we can't hear. I think uh, I, we have to unmute. We shall uh, continue. I think there's a problem with it. Professor Dr. Igor Calzada. Uh, Professor Dr. Ihab, if you uh, would you please give me a host because I'm not able to take it back. If you make me fast, it would be perfect because right now, and so Dr. I'm Dr. Professor Dr. Iha. Is it possible to give the? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm trying to make you the host again. Uh, On top right side of my. It's not working. Uh, my camera. Yes, I um, yeah. um. You are kind of inv evading my screen. So just a second. <laughs> I want to make you host again. Here we go. Uh, you should be host Perfect. now. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, dear Professor. It was indeed very interesting. We have we have some uh, questions we will discuss. Yeah, of course, I think uh, if it is so late in your uh, hometown, it is two a.m. Uh, I know that. <laughs> Just let's continue with Dr. Igor. Uh, Excuse me, I, could you please allow me uh, sharing the screen, please? I'm yes. trying. I got it. Okay, can you imagine it? Could you see the screen right now? Yes, perfect. Perfect, thank you very much indeed. Herkese, good night in. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my keynote presentation will revolve around several findings of my research on the technopolitics of smart cities and data governance models, stemming uh, from my recent book, as I mentioned before, published uh, by the end of 2020 through Elsevier, entitled Smart City Citizenship. Despite the title of the book um, and the explicit reference to the term smart cities, I must confess the um, existence, existence of the urban related content uh, in my book as such, rather than orchestrating the password smart cities, in fact, the book suggests not only a critical, but also a constructive standpoint to revert the technocratic implicit essence of the term in itself. In doing so, it provides definitions of key smart cities citizenship concepts, along with a technopolitical framework and a toolkit drawn from a community-oriented uh, perspective. 
Thus, the book provides an alternative, I would say, roadmap for experimenting, as the previous keynote speaker mentioned. It's not just about criticizing. I think we need to even experiment and transitioning from the side effects of the post-pandemic hyper-connected societies. Alongside uh, this fourth international conference of uh, contemporary uh, affairs in architecture and urbanism, um, a review summary of this book has been already shared in the chat um, in open access uh, published uh, by the Journal of Contemporary Urban Affairs. Um, the research uh, that I have conducted um, has been uh, driven by action research and has been examined through uh, social innovation lenses. This research has been conducted uh, since 2012 uh, from the University of Oxford, um, particularly in two programs, in the Future of Cities program, being uh, myself the PI of uh, Horizon 2020 project called Replicate, in which Turkey, Bursa province was part of, uh, of this project uh, for the audience. I think it's, it's worth to know that uh, a Turkish uh, territory was part of this project and is part also of the book. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, inviting you to have a look at it. Um, and also I was um, at the University of Oxford since 2012. I have been part of Urban Transformations ESRC funded uh, program. Uh, additionally, and it's worth saying that the book has been culminated over the last two years in Italy, when I've been uh, working as senior scientist uh, at the Joint Research Center at the European Commission, uh, mainly on the social impact of uh, digital transformations and artificial intelligence. As I mentioned in my uh, note at the, at the beginning of the, the early morning, I'm at the moment working as a senior advisor for UN Habitat program called People Center Smart Cities. So let's go to analyze a little bit the, 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 the content of, of the book. I would say that to examine a smart city citizenship is always important but perhaps never more urgent than right now in the fragile, I would underline fragile post COVID-19 hyperconnected societies. We are in a fragile uh, environment. We are all connected right now. It's fair enough, it's really good, but it's fragile and it's vulnerable. I would like to underline from the early beginning these two concepts because over the course of the pandemic, a, deb a debate has emerged about the appropriate technopolitical response, vaccine passports, contact tracing apps, and so on and so forth, when governments use disease surveillance technologies to tackle the spread of COVID-19, pointing out the dichotomy between state leviat and cyber control and civil uh, liberties, and further requesting in-depth debates at the regional level. So uh, amidst the AI-driven algorithmic disruption and surveillance capitalism, as Shosanna Fubov uh, argued in, in her book, my book sheds light on the way citizens could take control of the smart city and simply not vice versa. And it has been the case in uh, many discourses and practices over, uh, over the last 10 years, I would say. So um, generally speaking, my research intersects urban, digital and political transformations. I think that we cannot understand at the moment the urban phenomenon without the political and even the techno-political or the digital layer. I think that three are very much interconnected. Um, particularly, much more specifically at the moment, my research interest draws on how digital transformation processes driven by artificial inter intelligence disruptions in the post-COVID, but also in the post-GDPR, at least in the European context, um, are altering the socioeconomic conditions of new pandemic citizenship regime in cities and regions. And particularly, I'm working and paying special attention to the interplay of stakeholders. I think sometimes it's very much, not very much discussed that the, 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 the power imbalances between stakeholders. And this is why I'm working uh, with the idea of creating data and platform cooperatives as a resilient response to the post COVID-19 crisis. It goes without saying that having worked uh, for a decade, for 10 years in the largest cooperative industrial experience worldwide called Mondragon Cooperative Corporation in the Basque Country, 
in, in Spain has deeply influenced my research perspective and also the policy orientation that I have undertaken over, over the years. And as a result of this, I'm uh, glad and I'm pleased to share this open access uh, journal article published also by the, by the early 2021 uh, called Platform and Data Cooperatives um, Amidst the European Pandemic Citizenship um, from the European Commission, encouraging uh, cities and regions um, in the attempt, attempt to foster these specific social and business models that, are, that is uh, the, the cooperative model. Additionally, um, I would like to also uh, share with you at the beginning of my, of my talk, something that is very, very recent, has been published almost two weeks ago, um, that I co-author uh, this essay on data cooperatives for, plat for pandemic times in public seminar with, with Trevor Schultz from the new school in, in New York. Um, but probably um, the best way to summarize the book is by quoting the very well-known Welsh. Uh, I'm in Wales at the moment, so I need to uh, take advantage of, of very good authors. And I think Raymond Williams, the Welsh anthropologist, uh, he wisely, um, let's say, argued that technology is never neutral and it has the potential and the capacity to be used socially and po politically for quite different purposes. And probably this is in the core of, of, of my book. Regarding the smart city devolution, uh, smart city is eternal, has been has, has been highly criticized over the last 10 years. Initially it was interchangeably used as wire, cyber, digital cities. Then in 1990s emerging media, uh, later on the big corporation began to, to stake the claim on the, on the term. And the critical discourse gained momentum in 2011 with the frontline academics fiercely criticizing the term but with very few alternatives to offer, I would say, or at least to experiment with. But because many things has been written about the smart city, let me probably, there are four imaginaries displaying four potential misalignments of the term in the mind of many people when we refer to smart cities. Let me illustrate this with four movies. Um, it's likely that the smart cities have been recreated in the imaginaries of, for instance, um, the first one is modern times, emulating replicability. Every time we've been talking about uh, smart cities, we've been thinking about how to do things replicable. The second movie that I would like to bring here with you today is I think that we cannot understand the smart city without metropolis. The idea of showing an obsession uh, uh, with the efficiency as well, rationality, technical and economic rationality. But I think that uh, is not enough. I, I think that we need to add an, uh, the, third, the third movie, the third imaginary. And of course, the previous speaker has mentioned Blade Runner. Indeed, the smart cities has been also recreated around the idea of life promises, the well-being as a promise with the technology helping us to live much better. And I wonder whether it is the case at the moment or not, because, and this is the fourth movie, um, Spike Jones um, movie Hair uh, encourages us to uh, start thinking about the algorithmic dreams or even the algorithmic nightmares, we would say. The way in which big corporations, for example, are, let's say, extracting our data without our consent. Um, so actually, the evolution of the uh, smart city uh, concept, um, uh, starting from the early stage of the literature, more focusing on, let's say, urban and regional uh, perspective has moved quickly to a much more technopolitical content with a, 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 vast, and a, 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 a vast amount of, of literature on, on, on this topic from algorithmic suppression, automating inequalities, weapons for mass destruction, even platform capitalism, among many, many others. So uh, let's say that um, what I'm trying to argue also in the book is something that uh, from the MIT, Alex Pentland uh, argued that it was the need for a new deal on data, Put it, putting citizens in control of data that is about them and also creating data commons to improve both government and, 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 private, uh, and private industry. So let's see in a very, in a nutshell, 
to getting out from the smart city in the box uh, approach that has been hegemonic and has been mainstream over the last 10 years. So the book, uh, just I'm going to focus at the moment in the content, consists of nine intertwined key ideas. It could be easily represented as an espiral, as you can see on the right-hand side of the, of the, on the presentation. Each key intertwined idea shows systemically a path to follow as a technopolitical route for a smart citizen action from the social innovation um, perspective. But let's start from, from the first key idea, deconstructing. With the first idea, um, I refer to the need to debate on the technopolitics of data for citizens um, that cannot be seen as an operation of ethic washing. Uh, so it should be, I'm, I'm very, uh, let's say, stubborn around the whole book saying that it's about ownership and it's how to rescue democracy rather than talking about ethics because ethics at the, at the, at the end of the day rely on trust and trust cannot be the, the lever uh, without considering democracy as a whole. And it's why the second uh, key idea is a term that is key in the book that is called unplugging. Unplugging could be defined as a corrective from the corporate top-down direction of the smart city, smart city mainstream in favor of a transition towards a critical use of digital technologies, enabling the construction of a more democratic uh, citizenship. But this is why we need probably deciphering uh, the smart city citizenship. And this is why um, the book in the third chapter, uh, let's say, asks three main questions. What the prospects has existed so far for alternative funding and business and social models for cities? What are the practical and political interventions have been uh, tried among stakeholders with the idea that we need to uh, strike a balance between the power, uh, let's say the power of different stakeholders. And to sum up, um, this is also key, is another type of a smart city possible? Um, is there a third way between the state and the market that overcomes the public-private partnership? And is focused on the public-private partnership, the PPP framework, is why I'm suggesting, let's say, uh, moving beyond the public-private partnership as the only business models possible. So from the triple and the quadruple helixes, I'm suggesting that we need to embrace penta helix, which means that social entrepreneurs, activists, bricolers, brokers, assemblers play an important role as transformative intermediators, resulting in a wide range of business and uh, social models. Uh, and this idea of the pentahelix actually has been uh, experimented in, in six European uh, cities, in uh, Turkish, German, Swiss, Italian, Spanish, and British uh, uh, city, and it's in the book. And as a result of this, we, I, I, I arrived at the fifth key idea, mainly um, uh, arguing that um, the, so far, the policy understanding of the potential replication of urban uh, solutions from city to city has been quite simplistic. And is why, uh, as the uh, urban scholar Regional Data argued, the urban is not science, so it cannot replicate it like other sciences. So even we could argue that replication probably is not possible uh, among, among cities. So this chapter suggests an alternative policy cycle of replication based on mutual learning uh, among cities called uh, City to City Learning Program. Um, as a result of the Horizon 2020 Replicate project in which the Bursa province in Turkey has been actively participating in, in, in this definition of this experimental uh, policy uh, model. Um, probably defining city-to-city uh, -city learning is defined as a multidirectional, radial, dynamic, iterative, and further democratic model to learn from city to city. Um, Let's, uh, I, is where the way that I arrived to the sixth key idea, and it's maybe the less discussed idea on the smart city, and is the devolving. Um, uh, I'm re referring to data devolution. Um, let's say local data matters, something that this is the key idea of this chapter. Uh, so we don't have, we do not have to develop localized data policy schemes from um, the devolved administration. Data being a public good 
uh, should be devolved or brought back to citizens. And therefore, I think it's relevant that we need to um, take advantage multi-level governance uh, uh, schemes to, uh, to doing that. Uh, considering how relevant the city regional path dependency is in each territory, uh, in this chapter, I analyze uh, four cases, two in the UK, um, Bristol and Glasgow, in England and Scotland, respectively, and another two in, in Spain, um, Bilbao in the Basque Country and Barcelona in, uh, in Catalonia. Uh, so um, probably because Barcelona, the last one has been, let's say quite leading uh, city in common in data among their cities, the, the, this, this chapter, let's say, um, develops and, and introduces and examine, examines the case of Barcelona because since 2015, May 2015, Barcelona has started formulating the digital policies by considering citizens, decision makers rather than data providers. And I think it's key and at the moment is influencing many, many uh, cities around, around the world, even in the horizon 2020 and also particularly most importantly, the hue and habitat with a new definition that we are developed as the people center smart cities. Um, but we, can, we cannot understand uh, the whole discourse without protecting the, 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 seventh cha the eighth chapter. Um, I mean, the massive manipulation in the US uh, with the big, big tech corporation, but also the social credit systems in China uh, in contrast, these societal concerns rise at debate in Europe and the UK as well about the digital rights and the AI-driven algorithmic disruption spurred by spurring a call to action. And it's why this chapter is much more focusing on the digital rights and what do, um, what do we mean when we talk about have, uh, having digital rights, but also a much more controversial uh, con concept that is the digital, technological, and data sovereignty. There is a lot of discussions about sovereignty at this uh, stage. Uh, even working at the European Commission, I've been struggling with the concept. So I invite you to keep the path and keep following this interesting debate that we cannot take that for granted. Um, finally, resetting. This is the last chapter of the book. So against the odd pandemic citizens, we could say, are beginning to develop new ways of responding to the COVID-19 through mutualizing and also donating data, uh, using data altruism or data donation, including the creation of platform and data cooperatives. So I leave one question open at the end of the book, and it's why the recent publications that I presented at the beginning of my keynote, could digital cooperatives, either platforms or data cooperatives, could be the answer. We don't know, but the point is that at the moment, because all the global uh, societal concerns and challenges that we have, we must sharply hit the nail on the head in this probably final occasion. So thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. So looking forward to hearing from your questions in the queue and I, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Dr. Igor Klaas. I really uh, appreciate uh, the, your keynote. And I have asked to read your, uh, dear Dr. Igor Klaas, if you feel me uh, fast, I will try to uh, unmute Mr. Gun Faisal. Uh, seems that, or if you can. Okay, thank you, Mr. Faisal. And now let's get the host from Dr. Igor uh, to continue with Dr. Professor Dr. Hussein Sadri. Thank you. I had a chance actually with the, uh, to read uh, Dr. Klatsa's uh, article uh, of reviewing uh, the book of Smart City Citizenship. And it was interesting the way that you connect the vulnerability of the city uh, to use the local uh, data uh, to somehow develop your own specific method uh, uh, to reach to the idea of smart city. It was very interesting indeed. Even the case study that uh, you analyzed, one of the uh, 
the piece is that it was a smear, and thank you for uh, specifically focusing on that case study, which I, I think was uh, uh, support your aim on the, the way that has been designed the city. I think uh, uh, that was the reason that you used the, the smear. So we will, uh, the authors might have some questions at the end of finishing the keynotes. Uh, if somebody wants to ask any question from any keynotes speak, they will be available. Thank you. Uh, let's continue with uh, Professor Dr. Hussein Sadri. If uh, uh, Professor Dr. Igor gave me the host, I will try to, uh, or you can directly make uh, Professor Hussein Sadri host. Uh, 